Welcome, Transformation Talk Radio listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart, and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. I am so delighted to be here today for my show, Recovery Recharged, with the illustrious Dr. Pat. How are you? Oh, my goodness. I have been waiting for this show. This is one of those shows that you cannot talk enough about. Tell everybody what we're taking on today, because we are taking it on. Oh yes, we are taking it on, and we're and and certainly it's going to be at least one show because there is so much to cover and so many people can identify it. You know, this show, Recovery Recharged, you and I have talked for the past year now about being addicted to a particular substance, a particular thing, right? Yeah. On the show, we talked about being addicted to alcohol, being addicted to drugs, being addicted to food, right? We've even talked a little bit about being addicted to gambling and shopping and all of those things. But now, more than ever... I want people to understand that there is another addiction that we can all relate to, and that is being addicted to another human being. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we're going to really break it down, and we're going to drill down today, because most of the time people hear the terms, but they don't really realize, one, the impact and effect on their lives, two, how addicting it really is, and three, what, if anything, to do about it. You're absolutely right. So we're going to try to make some sense of it here. We're going to give you some ideas as to what you can do about it. And more than anything, we're going to try to make you aware of the fact that if this is something that is troubling you or this is something that you suffer from, there's help right? You don't have to go this alone, but you have to be aware of what you're doing. And that's why I wanted to bring it to the air today. When we are addicted to another person, we call that term codependence. And codependence actually means an excessive emotional or psychological reliance on a partner. And it was derived from typically being a reliance on the account of someone other than you having an addiction or an illness. So it way went, you know, it went way back. We are very familiar with the AA rooms, the Alcoholics Anonymous rooms, and the yep. Narcotics Anonymous rooms. But but not a lot of people are, are familiar with the Al-Anon rooms and the Naranon rooms. Dr. Pat, you want to tell us a little bit about yes, that? Yes, I do. And one of the things that, you know, really drops this down is one looking at the causes of what we're calling codependence. And by the way, you know, that is a term that some people love, some people hate, and some people wish we would never use. But basically, we're going to drop it down today and really explore it because a lot of times when the term is used, Ellen, it is a label that's put on somebody as if there was no cause for it. And that's really, that's part of the stigma around it. But look, sometimes they're biological, but sometimes they're also social, you know, psychosocial stressors around it. And it's different for men and women. Um, a lot of times we look at early life trauma and we look at the relationship of that and how that has to do with the interrelationships of personality. Uh, but there's so many ways to look at this, right? You know, things that would have people, let's say, score high on anxiety or need for approval or self-defeating thoughts. And that's what we're going to tease apart. Because the one thing that I want to say to everybody, if anybody has given you that label, you are not less than. And that is the number one thing that both Ellen and I want to just say to everybody, you are not less than, you are not less important. Your self-worth should be as high as anybody else's. And that's what we're here to help you with today. Exactly. And understand that if you care about someone, those things are valid and those feelings are valid. And like Dr. Pat said, the term codependent has been bandied around to be used for a myriad of things. What we want you to know is it did have a specific beginning and it does mean something in the world of understanding what good mental health is all about and what good relationships are all about. 
So what happened was the original term codependent came about because alcoholics and addicts went into the Alcoholics Anonymous rooms and the Narcotic Anonymous rooms. But then what began to emerge is that the loved ones of those addicts suffering also needed a place to go to beyond just yeah. watching their addicted loved ones suffer because we want to help. We always want to help. It's in human nature to help, to fix, to make better, right? We want, we don't want our partner to suffer. We don't want our children to suffer. We want to be able to make things better. And there was no place for those people to go talk, which is why the al rooms and the nar rooms were created. Yeah. And then going a little bit further, as those families started coming together and talking about how difficult it was to live with an active addict and alcoholic, problems started to arise and similarities started to arise as well. People talking to other people realized that there were things about this situation that they had in common. And on top of that, those people were not only dependent upon the addict and the alcoholic, but there were also things happening where in some ways, the person who was suffering really wanted to take care of that addict and alcoholic so much that it became a codependent role. Yeah. And for those of you out there, look, um, if you don't know who Lois Wilson is, um, you might want to look her up. She is the she was the wife of Bill Wilson, associated with Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and there is lots out there uh, of what she has written. And uh, my gosh, there's also been uh, movies done on her. But the point is this: one of the things that she says is, and this is something that we just don't talk about enough. You know, this is about when love is not enough. This is when love is not enough. And we're going to break this down today because if you're thinking about this, somebody may have said to you, you're codependent. Somebody, not anybody that really understands it, but maybe a friend. And what we want to say to all of you out there, it's more than just taking that label on. And Ellen, isn't this part of the dilemma, right? Sometimes we love someone and we do things because we love them, because we want to. Sometimes we love someone and we do things for them even when we don't want to. And that is a fundamental difference. That is a fun, I'm doing it for you because, geez, I need you to approve me. I need you to say hi. And you know, we, this, you don't have to be an adult. This could be in ch children, right? Exactly. It's a combination of things. You know, it's not only your partner that you want to be around, but maybe it's how you take care of your children and what you see. And because codependent emerged from the relationship between the addict and the non-addict doesn't mean it doesn't carry over into people that have nothing to do with addiction to alcohol and drugs. You know, there are so many popular TV shows out now, right? On Netflix, right? the ones that everybody's watching. Bridgerton, right? Everybody's watching Bridgerton and then I just started to, to watch a discovery of witches and I've been an outlander fan forever okay these two people are so in love right in 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 Bridgerton uh, you know it's it's uh it's I don't know Phoebe and Simon and and then in, in outlander it's Jamie and Claire and and a discovery of witches it's Matthew and and Diana and they have these relationships like you see on a Hallmark movie where they're inseparable they will do everything for each other and people think that that's what relationships should actually be about and the danger is if those relationships become codependent so I want to take a look at some of the signs of codependency. let's do it okay so one of the first ones that I put down is that people pleasing putting your relationship above your own interests right can we talk about some examples of those things yeah yeah. I mean, people pleasing is probably, I would say, one of the more mysterious, right? Because you wouldn't look at somebody, Ellen, and say, they are, uh, they're trying to please me. You wouldn't. They look like, and you and I know this, right? I mean, probably we've been down this pathway. We're the people that make sure that everything that you want and need, even if you say you want it and need, is taken care of. We're making sure not for one second 
that we enter into the realm of disappointment for you. We're going to go way overboard, even for things you haven't asked us to do. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you say that and you hit the nail on the head, Pat, because I just talked to a client the other day that turned around and said to me, one of the things I really love about my boyfriend is that he does everything for me. I said, what do you mean he does everything for you? She said, well, he puts out my clothes. I said, what? Why? He does what? <laughs> okay. He makes yeah. everything that I need. He makes me breakfast even if I'm not hungry. And I'm like, girl, okay, uh, no, 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 no. And she would turn around and say, but these are, these are so, you know, uh, this is the way he shows me that he cares and that mm. he loves me. And there's the difference between caring and caretaking right yeah, about yeah. actually taking care of another human being to the exclusion of yourself and that's certainly part of people pleasing right doing and boy everything it's a I dance can. a boy oh, it's I, a dance i i can't imagine what else you all talked about but sometimes <laughs> the dance looks like this yeah he does all that or she does all that but you know i don't want to hurt their feelings by telling them not to do it and yet you could tell we both had clients, right? Oh, Yet gosh. when they don't make your breakfast and you realize it, what is the comment you might make? Oh, the comment you make, Joe. Mike, is that they don't love me anymore. <laughs> oh, Joe, you didn't make my breakfast this morning. Are you feeling? A Look, it codependence, you can't do it by yourself. It takes two people. That's right. And understand that the term codependent means mutually codependent, a mutual dependence upon each other. And that's what happened originally between the addict and his or her spouse or yep. loved one or parent and child. It is mutual. It becomes parasitical. So they're both feeding off each other. And I yeah. want to make a distinction that we're going to talk about, if not on this show, another show. I will say this. One of the hardest things to break is a relationship with somebody that is literally classified as NPD, narcissistic personality disorder. I'm not talking about the way we throw the word narcissist around in our pop culture. No, that I'm not talking about. I'm talking about something that really is a living, breathing entity, narcissistic personality disorder. And that could be a whole show. And I want to say to everybody out there listening, we know that if that's you, one, we know how painful that is. We know that that addiction is harder to break than addiction from heroin. We know that. We know it's one of the hardest addictions to break from. And we know what the real hook is. Yes, we know you want to maybe change them or save them. Um, and there are a handful of people right now that work with those of us, those of you that have been in relationships with folks like this. We're starting at the beginning to talk about codependence. We may take on the conversation of MPD later. But right, th th there's a clear distinction here. For a minute, Absolutely, if you don't mind. there is. We are really talking about the person that is trying to have a healthy relationship yep. and what a healthy relationship looks like. And here are some of the warning signs of what you might want to do to move away from this kind of codependent behavior, including narcissistic behavior. Mm -hmm. For instance, another one of the signs of codependency is if you have difficulty making making decisions in your relationship, if you you have to base what you want to do solely dependent upon what your partner wants, right? Don't you see that? I know that, you know, I know if you want to make an appointment with somebody, you may have to turn around and say, well, I, you know, let me just discuss it, discuss it with my wife or my husband. That's normal. That's not abnormal. But if every decision you make, you defer to your partner that's a sign of codependence. I can't tell you how many people Jessica and I have talked to, uh, women that have wanted to launch their career, do their own radio shows, ready to go. They're excited. Everything is ready to go. And they have to speak to their partner. And the next email we get is, spoke to my partner. It's a no. It's a no-go. That makes and me crazy. 
<laughs> I, I can't tell you how heartbreaking oh. it is for us oh. to watch. Uh, now, I will tell you, it's 90% of the women, but it's not ex- it's not exclusive to women. This is not a woman thing. We just need to say that, right? This Absolutely. is not a woman thing. It is thing. not a woman thing. Absolutely not. Women sometimes have trouble finding their voice, but uh, I have a lot of male clients who go through the same thing, especially in the people-pleasing category, that they want to make sure that the world thinks well of them. Men are very, very concerned about their outward image, and because of that, codependence is very prevalent in their relationships. It is not only restricted to women, for sure. And I want to stress to everybody out there that a lot of the work that I do in recovery and a lot of the work that I do as an empowerment coach is dealing with codependent situations. So I really have to tell you that I am willing to uh, work on that. And one of the things that, like I said, I do on a regular basis is codependent. So please, you know where to contact me on my 800 mm-hmm. number, 800 800 887-1757, sorry, 800-889-1757, and we'll talk about it. And but let me just it- say, let me just say this about your work, because I want to be clear to everybody. This work that Ellen does, this goes beyond addiction. You might be in a very, very harmful codependent relationship with your boss, with a coworker. I mean, this goes beyond that. Let's, because Helen, it doesn't matter. You work with people helping them across the board. It doesn't exactly. matter. Across with your teacher, board. with your mother, it doesn't matter. But let's talk about some of the other signs because some of these other signs are less obvious and equally important. Difficulty in communicating your feeling. This one right here, oh. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, how do you feel? Oh, fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fine. I love that word, fine. Oh, my God. And the eyes are, your tears are just rolling down your face. But, yes. but why do you think this is? Why do you think that this is a difficulty? I think part of it is that we expect our partner to be mind readers. We expect them to know already what we want. That's part of it. And Mm -hmm. the other part of it is if you're in a true codependent relationship, you're afraid that your feelings, whatever they are, will not be validated by another person. Mm -hmm. Your feelings all of a sudden don't matter. So you want to, don't want to be able to share them. You don't want to share them with that person because if you're in a bad mood, you don't want to invade another person's space with that. And you're so afraid to share who you are. You lose your identity in a codependent relationship. And that's something that, that is the most prevalent I want to make sure that you have your own voice and you have your own identity. And and in conjunction with that, in not only being able to communicate your feelings, is is so valuable valuing the approval of others more than your own approval. You don't know who you are until somebody else says, Oh my God, you're great. Don't you think? Oh no. And and you know, that one right there, that's the one that has so many layers. It's it's like a giant onion. It's got so many layers. It's really hard to see yourself in that one. You can see yourself in some of these others, you know, where you say, Oh yeah, I do have difficulty in my feelings. But this one right here is this one about valuing the approval of others more than valuing yourself. This is the one where most people need coaching help with because you've lived a lifetime like this. Absolutely. Ingrained for years and years. The clients that I work with turn around and say to me, I only know that I'm doing a good job if I hear that from my sister or my brother or my parents. And these people are not youth. They're not young. They're in their 40s and 50s and 60s and turn around and say, I only know that I am doing the right thing if someone else approves of it. If I can look to someone else and say, am I okay? Am I all right? Am I good enough? Yeah. How (laughs) often have you put on clothes and you're going to go to the mall or you're going to go out with your friends and you're ready to go and you come down the stairs 
right? You're feeling great. You got on earrings you love. You got, you're ready to go, your favorite shoes. And you're walking out the door, maybe a loved one, a spouse, or maybe the friend that picked you up says something like, are you sure those blue shoes go with that red jacket? And before you blink, okay, I can feel you all out there, right? I got, I felt the energy shift right here, right here. I felt it shift. And before they're even done with their sentence, you have made a beeline upstairs to change one or the other. Exactly. Exactly. And oh my God, does that make me crazy? It just makes me crazy. <laughs> but it makes you feel unsure and it contributes yes. to this, this next one, which I think is the most insidious. Lacking well, trust in yourself and having poor self-esteem. Exactly right. And yeah. that's what happens. You're unsure of your own decisions. You need somebody else to tell you whether or not your decisions are valid. And that is a complete loss of identity. And that's what happens in a true codependent relationship. Not only that, but I see mothers with children, all right? I, I can't tell you how many mothers are older and they still have adult children living at home. And yeah. those adult children and the parents are completely codependent with each other. So that I can talk to that client and I can turn around and say, how are you feeling today? How is everything? And the words out of their mouth are... Well, my son is just in a really bad mood, so I am depressed. Parents are still tied to their children like they're still tied by the umbilical cord, and that yeah. child could be an adult child, and this can be an adult parent. But you cannot, I mean, it's not only lacking the trust in yourself and having poor self-esteem, but it is having your moods be dependent upon another person's moods. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're going to talk more about this when we come back from break. We're going to talk more about the relationship, the codependent and uh, en enabling and the relationship between addiction, any kind of addiction, by the way. Uh, it could be AAOA, alcohol, drugs, eating, gambling. It doesn't matter. We're, we're, we're going to really point some things out to you. Um, but here's the thing that's really important, right, Ellen? And this is really the key. This is why you have to work with somebody on this. It's because there's a difference between somebody saying to you, what do you want for dinner? And you say, you know, I really don't care. Because honestly, if you're me, I don't really care. If you're going to make me dinner, honestly, I don't care. It, 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 generally speaking, I know you well enough to know you're not going to slap something on that plate that I'm not going to eat. Or if somebody says, what movie do you want to go to? And you say, why don't you decide? There are people that really don't care. They just really want to spend time with you or they want, that's not their priority to make that decision. That is a fundamental difference between choosing not to want to have an opinion versus not having an opinion because you're afraid to have one. When exactly. we come back, we'll take that on. Before we go to break, Ellen, how do people find out more about you? How do they work with you? Because this is an area where this is so rampant right now. People are struggling with this in their home. Their children are struggling with it. How do they work with you? Pushy Broad from the Bronx.com. I will give you a free session because I'm doing a COVID-19 stress mm -hmm. session. Codependence is one of those things. I actually had a lot of clients last week book and take advantage of it. And then mm -hmm. we can go from there and see how you're working. Or you can call me toll free at 800-889-1757. We can get to the crux of it. This is part of recovery, having healthy relationships, making healthy choices, and really finding your identity and your voice. And I want to say this, I want to talk about this really, really quickly, what Ellen said. This is part of recovery from accelerating this particular tendency due to COVID situation. Because what we're finding is things like addiction and codependence have really crept up the scale because you didn't really need to have the tool before, but now y'all living under one roof doing a whole bunch of things and you really don't have the tool. This is why we're doing this show today. Please get a hold of Ellen. When we come back, we're going to talk about enabler. Me? What do you mean? <laughs> I just told my friend I'd drive him home. Oh, 
like when? Oh, like after they're so drunk, they can't walk. Oh, okay, I get it. Oh, but you're not an enabler. It's tricky, folks. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Yep, look, we are, of course, here with Ellen Stewart, the host of Recovery Recharged, Pushy Broad from the Bronx. Today, what she is taking on is something that is so prevalent right now, and especially showing up in the folks she's working with, addicted to another person, how to break the cycle. Um, and as I said before, um, there are many ways you can find out about Ellen. But Ellen, tell folks again about the 30-minute session. T- tell them what you're doing. Right on my website, pushybroadfromthebronx.com. It says, book a free 30-minute COVID-19 session to discuss your stressors. And that could be anything. Whatever you want to talk about about with me for 30 minutes, I'm more than happy. The appointments are filling up, so get in there, make an appointment. You goes right to a calendar, choose a date and time, and I'll be there to talk to you face-to-face on Zoom or call me at 800-889-1757. We'll make an appointment. Lots of things are keeping up, kicking up. We're still in isolation, basically. It's going on for a little while until we all get vaccinated. We still have to be ultra careful. And because we are indoors and we're with our family members, lots of stuff is kicking up. And one of those things is what we're tackling today. And it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to being codependent. And I want to let you guys know that you don't have to be an addict or an alcoholic to suffer from codependency. And you don't have to be a loved one of an addict or an alcoholic to suffer from codependency. You can be in a relationship that you kind of know needs work. Mm. Or maybe it's the relationship between you and your children that needs work. So let, we're going to give you some more examples of things that you may not even be aware of, which would be considered codependent behavior. Um, maybe your partner provides the only happiness in your life, according to you, and you're not feeling truly happy unless your partner is with you, or you can't imagine not having them in your life. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there that are going to tell me that their relationship is like a Hallmark movie, right, Dr. Pat? Yeah. That they're inseparable, all right? That they're joined at the hip like Siamese twins. And... <laughs> And I want you to know that you still have to have two independent minds, two independent ways of thoughts, which means that no matter what, you can survive with or without your partner. Right? You understand, Dr. Pat? Well, people have been doing it for tens of thousands of millions of years. That's right. Um, But we never think we're strong enough. We never think we have the tools and there's never been more tools and people to work with like you, Ellen, you know, than there is now. It doesn't mean that you don't love the person. I don't want to give people the wrong idea. We want you to have the best relationship in the world. Okay. And if your relationship models Bridgerton or Outlander or whatever, we love that. If it's a Hallmark movie, that's fabulous. And if you're completely happy, we wouldn't do anything to change that. But if you want to be able to be you and go along with your goals and live your life and have your voice and still be in a relationship that complements you, then these are the ways to to having a healthy relationship. And you have to understand that your mood does not depend upon your partner's mood, as we talked about before. You can't blame your partner if you're unhappy. If you feel sad, it's not always your partner's fault. Or you're sometimes, oh, here is this, here's all the time, just like a Hallmark movie, you're waiting to be rescued, right? Well, let's talk about that. Oh, that, that that's God. one that we can't really see very clearly. Oh. It, it doesn't show up like that. Um, but it really has the underpinnings of, I don't trust myself well enough to do it on my own. Uh, I'm not going to be able to survive this if I don't get help from X. I don't think I'm going to be able, I don't have the confidence to really do the things I want to do without why. And these are the things we say to ourselves all the time. It's the, it's the, (laughs) it's this, what they call the Cinderella complex. I need to be saved. But if you take a look at Cinderella, she was quite a strong lady, independently of Prince Charming. 
That's what that's all about. Or if you're a mother or a wife and you want to take care of your partner in a way that does not allow them to have their own voice, make decisions for themselves. I know that growing up, lots of times, it was always based on my parents' uh, decisions and my parents' opinions and not mine. And and we come from that upbringing sometimes, right? Don't you find that your upbringing has a lot to do with the relationships you have today? Yeah. 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 It's the thing, Ellen, that like this, right? It's the thing where you walk into the room and all of a sudden you see somebody like way over there, however you see them, like over there, you haven't met them, you don't know them. And all of a sudden you're completely magnetically drawn to them for whatever reason. Maybe it's somebody that's full attention, life of the party, or Maybe it's somebody that's sitting in the corner and not paying attention to anybody. Those are two extremes, but it doesn't matter. You're immediately walking in the room. Oh my God, it's love at first sight. And boom, there you go. Why? Because it reminds us of something. Exactly. It reminds us of what we had before or reminds us what we're longing to have. And that's, you know, that's the kind of thing where infatuation takes over. And in that rose colored glass situation, you can make any fantasy you want out of the relationship. And sometimes by doing that, you tend to put yourself last because you try so hard to please another human being or you try so hard to make everybody happy because you think this is your purpose in life to make my partner happy, to do anything I can to make them like me. I can't tell you how many of my clients tell me that I'm in this relationship and I haven't really been able to tell my partner who I am yet. And I'm like, what? (laughs) What do you mean? Yeah. It's like this persona that we take on sometimes so that that other person will, will think that we are absolutely the best. Perfect. We're perfect. Perfect. Right. We're perfect. Exactly. You know, the wall literally explodes the first time two codependent people have a fight. If that's even possible, if it's even possible, but, but right there, you step into the Twilight Zone or a version of the X-Files for a minute because you realize that I am spending 99% of my time trying to change you, right? And right. you don't want to change. That's right. That's exactly right. Codependent people spend 99% of their time trying to change another person. But the best thing that we learn about codependency and the best thing that we learn in recovery, here's the one big thing. This is a mantra that we should all wear on our foreheads. You ready for this? Yeah. The only person you can change is you. That's it. That's it. Okay. The only person I can change is me. Dr. Pat, the only person you can change is you. And we can't change anybody else. And if we could just get that one simple thing, there would be no codependent relationships at all. Yeah. But we try so hard to change the other person. Yeah. I want to talk to you about this thing here real quick. Because we started to, earlier in the show, we talked about the relationship between the addict and the enabler. And I want to I want to also bring it back here because this is also part of a dance that gets done. And I wasn't kidding when I said that there are scenarios where you might go out with your spouse or your partner and they clearly know that their job is to drive you home every day. They know that what exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to play out. And, you know, the worst thing that they want to do is offend you by saying no, you cannot do that. That's not going to work for me or whatever the language is. So there are parts of enabling. Can we talk about what that's a term that gets thrown around a lot? And it's another one of these categories that somebody says, that's what you are. It is the worst thing we could do is to start to label people like that, because we're not interested in labeling people. We're interested in helping people change things for themselves. But that term gets thrown around and many people don't even know what it is. Can you give us some examples of that? Absolutely. I can go through a couple that maybe you will be, you know, everybody will be familiar with. For instance, maybe you're lending money to your addictive loved one, not realizing that they'll spend it on drugs. 
or if your loved one has consequences because of his addiction. He loses his job, so you take him in. Or he loses his apartment, so you also get him a place to live. Or you start paying his rent for him. Or you realize that you're protecting him from the consequences. And I've done it myself. I've bailed people out of jail more, more times than they should have been bailed out. Right? They yeah. should have stayed in jail. You want to fix. You want to make sure everything is okay. Or you hide the drinking right or the drugging you tell the family that everything is okay yep. you help the the the, the alcoholic the, or the addict off the floor you tuck them into bed you save them from the embarrassment of waking up the next morning on the kitchen floor all of those little things you cover up their abuse when the neighbors inquire about it you say everything is fine or you make excuses for them not showing up at a party or an event over and over and over again some of those things that we do all the time. Or they keep getting fired from their job and you keep telling everybody, well, you know, it really wasn't for him and he's moving on to something better, right? Right. right. Oh my God. Or you lie to your children about what's going on with their father or their mother. They're not getting out of bed in the morning because they're tired or they're sick all the time. Or you're calling up work and make excuses for him because he can't come in because he's hung over. All of these little things prevent the addict or the alcoholic from reaping the consequences. And what we learn in recovery is that actions, positive or negative actions, have consequences. Yeah. yeah. You know, part of this, Ellen, too, and let's address this now, you know, look, we know these things and we're, and look, we're only touching on a few of these high level things. The impact of all this is low self-esteem, shame, guilt right? And everybody that's listening, you know what it feels like. It also can lead to personal and substance abuse, right? It also leads to a level of addiction to abuse that you think I'll never be able to get out from under this abusive thumb that I'm under. And this is what we're saying here today. We're finding that the acceleration of this uh, due to the circumstances around COVID-19, um, they're really accelerating. And yet this is the way we've got to get you some help around it. Even if you don't know what you don't know, because a lot, this is new for a lot of people, Ellen. It's not only new, but it, a lot of people are in denial, which is why we try to give specific examples. Because as people are listening to this, they're saying, well, no, it's still okay. It's okay. It'll be okay. No, it won't be okay. Mm -hmm. Because it's going on forever and ever. And if you're still trying to do something and go at it the same way all the time and expect different results, we know that that's not going to work. Yeah. So, so I want to spend the rest of the hour yep. talking a little bit about what, what you can do. Not only give me a call, but some of the things we want you to get from this, some ways to overcome the codependence, or at least be aware of what you're doing and start to emerge um, healthier for yourself, okay? Well, yeah. The first one we already talked about, and that is the mantra, the only person you can change is you. Okay, you can change that other person. So I need you to try to back away from that person and let that person go through the consequences of their actions, whatever it is. If it's an addict who is suffering, let them face the consequences of their actions. You did not cause it and you cannot cure it and you cannot fix it. If you're in a relationship that does not involve an active addict or an alcoholic, I want you to know that you have a voice. You have emotions that you can manage. You can be in control of your own emotions. You don't have to fix things or control other people's emotions. And you cannot protect a loved one from facing their own consequences. Right. 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 So you say to and yourself. And boy, do we want to, though. Oh my God, all the time. You have to say to yourself, you're not a knight in shining armor. 
You cannot rescue or protect a loved one, okay? You have to let them face consequences. Even young children have to face consequences, right? When they do something wrong, they have to be punished. If they get into a situation that they have to work out, they have to work it out on their own. That's how people learn to think for themselves. Yeah. And, you know, the thing I love about what we're talking about, and especially with working with another person, is you learn to do this, first of all, under safe guidance, under non-judgmental guidance. And then you learn to do this one step at a time. And sometimes it seems insurmountable. It seems, my gosh, I've never been able to blank, 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 blank. Why do you think I can do it now? Well, this is one of these things just like addiction this is a journey you don't take alone. You're absolutely right, Dr. Pad. And the first step in this journey is awareness. And that's what we try to bring to the table when we do this show. There are many, many things that you may not have thought were a problem, but they seem to always creep up. And they seem to fill you with anxiety, with stress that you're not really aware of. I have clients come to me and say, my sleep is disrupted because I'm grinding my teeth at night and I'm not really sure what this stress is all about. And then we start to look at the patterns in in your life and then you realize that there are some things that you can no longer put up with you have to face and awareness is one of these things and this is the way that we start so if you're finding that you are in any kind of codependent relationship there is help for this you do not have to stay this way understanding that you do have the right to your own personal boundaries right? Everybody has a right to say, no, this isn't working for me anymore. I'm not going to put up with this. It, you, your addiction or your problems are not my secrets to keep. It does not matter what the world thinks because I don't care what the world thinks. Mm -hmm. And in today's world, Dr. Pat, nobody, <laughs> nobody can turn around and say they're alone in these problems, right? There are so many yeah. people. We talked about the fact that alcohol sales are up 500% in the middle of COVID-19. Yeah. There's yeah. nobody we don't know that's not suffering from an addiction. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, and that's just a sidebar. I, many of you, a couple of you actually emailed me, but you heard me talk about the fact that uh, I went to get a pizza the other night and right next to the pizza place is your friendly local uh, CBD, THC, marijuana store. And that line on a regular basis to get in there, by the way, they're very COVID safe. So I just need to say that. But the line goes down and around. And, you know, we're not saying that every bit of this is addictive. What we're saying is that the pain of what you're experiencing gets to be too much. And without knowing how you can get relief, what we're finding is food is self-medicating, alcohol is self-medicating. We want to help you not go down that path. Exactly. And we also want you to know that in this time of isolation, especially with COVID-19, this is a perfect time for self-development. Yeah. For moving in the direction of knowing who you are and what you want. There are so many people that are thriving because they're first beginning to realize that they want to make strides in knowing who they are as people, finding their own voice and finding their identity, which is exactly what the Pushy Broad from the Bronx is absolutely equipped to help you do. Because it's, it's the one thing I've learned in being a Pushy Broad is that we're all entitled to our own voice, not in an overt way where it, you're trying to knock somebody over, but in a way where you do not have to hide who you are in order to please another person, whether or not they're addicted to substance. So I want you to be able to get that help. I want you to understand what a good, healthy relationship is all about. And even if you're not sure if you're codependent, because many people, like you said, don't know the difference between caring and caretaking and will turn around and say, well, I don't really care what we eat for dinner, right? Or I don't really care what movie we go to. I want you to be able to discern the difference between codependent and healthy. And that's what I'm here to do as the pushy broad. 
we talked about a lot today, um, but it is all under the umbrella of freedom, personal freedom. And it, it's quite often, Ellen, that we don't connect the dots between phrases and language and categories like codependent enabler. We don't usually connect the dots between having that label or feeling that that's you and self-labeling versus we're talking about a pathway to freedom, you know, personal freedom, freedom Absolutely. in the outer world and, and in a sense of empowerment. That's really what we're talking about helping people with today. And empowerment is a very big deal. And I know, like you said, that people bandy around the words codependent and enabling. And the reason they do that is because those words have meaning. Yeah. They came out because of legitimate diagnosis and legitimate feelings that came across to, to uh, people in relationships. And it has its prevalence in this society. Unfortunately, it is more prevalent than we would like to admit. Yeah. So you know, I was, though, go ahead. I was talking to somebody and we should mention this too, Ellen, because we haven't, we haven't even done a show about this yet, but I was talking to somebody the other day and I was just listening to her and it is really clear to someone like me and probably somebody like you that when you have a partner that's spending an enormous amount of hours now working from home and he's got porn or he is she, he or she. I'm not giving out the name. He or she is online chit-chatting with somebody that is not their partner or spouse. This is the latest new ever-rising other form of addiction. And this is really uncharted territories for partners. And let me just say this. This is not just a partner for, this is not an issue for heterosexual couples only. This exactly. is partner to partner. I don't care who it is, brother and sister, mother and father. I, I, this is a thing and it requires help, right, Ellen? We haven't done a show about this yet. Absolutely. And it's on my list to do for sure because it's a really, really big thing. And yeah. um, we're going to address that because a lot of couples come to me with that. They also come to me with shopping addiction because now oh. we can let our fingers do the walking and we're shopping like crazy. Amazon, boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> or or gambling addiction because now you can do everything online and all of that stuff so i have all kinds of experts for, coming from all different places and today is the most important one i believe because it transcends everything just like in the first step in addiction we admitted we were powerless over others and that our lives have become unmanageable if you find that you are spending too much time and too much attention on your partner or on your children it is time to learn how to let it go and still love and hold on to your identity and hold on to everything that's really important to you being you right the only person you can change is you and one of the things ellen we should also mention is this whenever you implement a, a, an empowering change in your behavior in your life, and it has to do with other people, there are ways that we must learn how to go about doing that. That's part of the coaching that we're talking about here today. You know, of course, there's always a way of walking in a room and saying, you know what, I ain't doing this anymore. Let me tell you, from this point on, this is what we're going to do. God, Ellen's that laughing. Great, right? <laughs> Ellen, that, that, that may work once in a while, but there are some things that Ellen can help you with. And that is part of it. It's not just the end game or the end results. It's also the how. Isn't that equally important, Ellen? Without a doubt. Oh, my goodness. If I could sprinkle some magic dust and say, <laughs> okay, well, your problems are away. Go away. You're no longer addicted to another person. You're no longer addicted to drugs or alcohol. My goodness, would we have a, a fortune of money. There are ways. There are steps to take to be able to start to slowly make changes. Like you said, we have been doing this for years and years and years. Change doesn't happen like that. You just don't turn around and all of a sudden everything is fine. That's what you need a coach for. That you, that's what you need a recovery coach for, to learn how to shift your thinking and behaviorally moderate your thought process so that you can form new healthy habits yeah. one step at a time, one day at a time. That's what it's 
all about. So. And, you know, we are talking about habits, and that's really equally important. You know, just because you've spent $2,000 on a, bi a bicycle machine that you're going to watch, that you're going to get on, only to realize, geez, you haven't gotten onto it once, there's help with that as well. Because exactly. it's really about changing a habit. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, you're not using it as a clothes hanger, right? Exactly. I understand. Oh, my God. Were you in my house? <laughs> what? Oh, my gosh. Ellen, thank you for today. I know there's more to come on this because this is a, a very important topic. And every day it's growing as an important topic and it's really being unattended to. How do people find out about you? How do they get to work with you? And tell us about the uh, session that you're offering people. Pushy Broad from the Bronx.com right in the front. It says free COVID-19 session on stress. Mm -hmm. You can use it for anything you want, including today's topic. If you're addicted to something, I'd be happy to talk to you. If you're going through the stress of COVID-19, like we all are, my clients are coming from all over the world. So please, please, please make an appointment right online. Pushy Broad from the Bronx.com or my 800 number, 800-889-1757. I am here to help you in your recovery. Ellen, thank you so much. What's your personal message? What do you want to leave us with today? I want everybody to understand that change happens slowly, one day at a time, but there is always hope. As long as you are alive, there is hope. And I'm here to help you no matter what. And I want to say to everybody out there is this. Know that whatever label somebody else has put on you, whatever you think you are, that you're less than everyone else, the reason we do this show is to remind you that whatever you are or whatever you think you are, you're much more powerful than that. Thanks to Matt James giving me that. That is a daily reminder and you're worth getting the help you need to have the freedom and life that you deserve. Thank you all for tuning us in. Thank you, Ellen, for a great show. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, Benny, thank you for pushing all the right buttons. Jacob, thank you for making this flow smoothly on social media, Facebook. We'll see you next time.